Hello, I'm Andrea Schnepp from CP3. And I'm Guillaume Labelle from CP2. And we are going to present to you our work on functional structural plant models as tools for sustainable crop production. Land degradation, increasing water scarcity, the need to reduce fertilizer inputs, as well as negative impacts of climate change, limit the potential for necessary yield increases. Understanding soil root interactions is required to shift towards a sustainable crop production. And in this regard, functional structural plant models are currently developing into tools to aid in the design of agricultural management schemes and in the selection of root rates for improving plant performance in specific environments. Functional structural plant models have two parts, namely the structure and the function. By structure, we mean the description of plant development in three-dimensional space, such as topology, morphology and geometry of the different plant organs, such as leaf, stem or root. And by function, we mean the description of relevant processes, including soil water flow and root water uptake, photosynthesis, carbon flow and rhizote deposition, nutrient transport and uptake, as well as plant growth. Functional structural plant models need parameterization. I am focusing here on a specific part, namely the root system. Those can be parameterized from available images, both two-dimensional and three-dimensional. On the left image, you see an example of a hand drawing from the so-called Wurzel Atlas, in which hand drawings of mature root systems are available. The root system in this image was automatically tracked by a software called Root System Analyzer. The image in the middle is an example of an aeroponic setup and, uh, in which 2D flatbed scans were made and the root systems were tracked with a software called SmartRoot. Finally, on the right, you see a three-dimensional image, in this case from MRI scans, and the root systems were tracked manually in a holobench system. In each case, parameterizing from images includes a segmentation step and a tracking step that results in the, in the position and the connectivity of different root segments. We store this in a format called root system markup language. And from this data structure, we can directly compute root system architecture parameters such as the distance between branches, branching angles and root lengths. Growth parameters can also be obtained if time series are available or they can be obtained from a single image by fitting growth functions to an estimated root age versus length data. Another way to parameterize root architecture from is to use field data and inverse parameter estimation. On the image, you see an example of a root system and five soil cores that are taken at different distances away from the center of the plant. From this, aggregate, from this information, we can compute aggregated information such as root length densities, and those can be compared to field data from soil coring. The parameter estimation is a multi-objective and multi-parameter optimization problem and the stochasticity of the root system architecture model adds complexity. The result of the inverse parameter estimation partly depends on the field observation method such as coring, trenching or observation using rhizotubes. We use a modified MCMC algorithm called DREAM to inversely estimate root system architectures from field coring data. From that we not only receive, obtain um, a single parameter value, but a parameter distribution as well as information about the correlation between different parameters. Soil properties and soil environmental conditions can influence the development of uh, roots in the soil. I'm going to present now uh, an example in which the existence of biopores modified the growth of roots and how we modeled this. 
The starting point was an X-ray CT image of a pore space geometry. We created a simplified pore space geometry from this CT image and used this to create a soil domain with five different layers and a continuous biopore system. The root growth was simulated by explicitly considering the biopores and we modeled it in an analogy to Darcy's flow equation, namely that the direction of the root growth is determined by a direction of the root growth under isotropic uh, conductance and then a conductance tensor, which determines uh, an isotropy due to biopores. I'm going to start now a video that shows how the root, roots grow in this soil, to, soil domain, including the biopores. The root architecture growth model was coupled to a soil water flow model and root water uptake was computed. On this graph you see uh, the cumulative transpiration in two different types of soils, namely a silt loam and a sandy loam, uh, and the orange line indicates the potential transpiration, whereas the colored lines indicate the cumulative transpiration under different treatments, including or not including biopores, and considering or not considering uh, the limit, a limited root soil contact in the biopores. The solid and the dashed lines indicate a low and a high soil bulk densities. It was found that the impact of the biopores on cumulated root water uptake is greater for dense than for loose soils. The impact of biopores on cumulated root water uptake is greater for the sandy loam than for the silt loam and the impact of limited root soil contact in biopores on root water uptake is only small. Overall, we can say that the simulations showed that biopores, biopores substantially mitigate transpiration deficits in times of drought, even under the assumption of reduced root water uptake in biopores due to limited root soil contact. The next example is about modeling phosphate uptake by upland rice. It is a continuum multiscale simulation of a virtual pot experiment. The background is that upland rice is often grown where water and phosphorus are limited. In this example, C plant box was used to simulate rice root systems, root system development inside cylindrical growth containers, and DUMOX was used to solve the water flow and phosphate transport in the soil root system. Finally, DUMUX was extended to represent small-scale nutrient gradients and water dynamics in the rhizosphere by 1D radially symmetric models that represent the rhizosphere around each small root segment of the root system. In the video, we can see the roots growing inside the soil container and the disks represent the soil sink terms of phosphate uptake. Altogether, six different treatments were virtually simulated, three different phosphorus treatments and two different water conditions, one with drying cycles and one where the water content was kept at field capacity. The model revealed the role of the different types of laterals that are characteristic for rice root systems under the different pea and water treatments. The results showed that root system architecture was significantly affected by the phosphorus and the water treatments. Based on the root system architecture and transpiration prescribed according to measurements, the model accurately predicted the P uptake. Plant P uptake increased with increasing P and water supply, and the drying periods reduced P uptake at high but not at low P supply. For all treatments, the L type laterals become more important for the overall and P uptake than the S type laterals in the dry scenarios. 
So in the in the next uh, few slides, I will uh, show you our recent work on the whole plant models. So moving from root models to a model which has both the root and the shoot. And, and the, the first question I would like to, to address is why do we need to bother with uh, whole plant models? Why can't we just stick to one part, which was historically uh, the case? Well, the first reason is that uh, a plant is not just a root or just a shoot, it's both at the same time and the, the shoot and root form a single network. And that single network does not have one unique connection point, or at least not in all the plants. And here on the right side, you can see an example where with a, a monocot plant or monocot type of plants. And because that plant has roots forming on the nodes, for instance, then that means that you have multiple connections between the root and between the shoot parts. And in that case, it's worth considering the whole plant because the fluxes between these two parts will not be unique and might change depending on the root or the shoot part that you are looking at. How do we conceptualize that interplay between the carbon and the water? Well, we have two systems into, uh, on our plant. So we have the structure on the plant and on top of that structure, we put a xylem. So that's what we've done uh, before with the water. And so the xylem will transport the water from the soil toward uh, the atmosphere following um, the gradient of water potential. And we have a second network, which is the phloem network. And the phloem network, what we do is uh, we move the carbohydrates within the phloem following osmotic gradients. And then there is then loading of carbohydrates at the leaf level that will increase the osmotic potential within the phloem that will drive an inflow of water from the xylem into the phloem that will push the water downwards towards uh, the sinks. Once we have that connection, we could then simulate the interplay between the water and between the carbon and in particular we wanted to see how the soil would drive preferential flows within the systems so what we did and that you can see on the the small plants on the left uh, hand side uh, we have a very small plants with one root in dry soil and one root in a wet soil what we could observe is two different dynamics if we look at either the phloem or the xylem. So if you look at the, the xylem, we have a larger flow for the roots sitting in a wet soil. That's because there is no more water in the soil and so the, the flow can be higher. But that higher flow diluted the, uh, the flow of carbon in the, that root as well. So we have more water flowing into the, into the phloem, into that root, and that led to a less amount of carbon flowing all together from that root. So we have more water flowing into the wet zone, but more carbon flowing into the dry zone. And that type of behavior was also um, observed experimentally. What we are doing now is actually implementing, going a bit forward and implementing a feedback loop between that uh, distribution of carbon within the roots and the growth, but that's uh, still very much a uh, work in progress. So to conclude, what we, we showed you in this uh, presentation is, on the one hand, we have more and more individual processes that are being implemented into the functional structural plant model or functional structural root models. And that allows us to answer more and more questions, or at least to address more and more questions within uh, these models. And we also have a more complete set of methods for parameterization of these models based on field uh, data. The major outlook that we want to share with you is that uh, in the future, we really want to, to be able to model dynamic plants in a changing environment. So having multiple feedback loops between the soil, between the atmosphere and between the plant. But that is still very much uh, challenging. One reason being that the, the experimental data on that is rather scarce. And so we need to have more good data also to be able to have these feedback loops. Another challenge, another way we want to go is upscaling local plant processes in a way that is relevant for 
uh, larger scale process. So these local scale process that are very much detailed in our functional structural plant models can lead to emergent properties that we could put into the field scaled uh, models. So either uh, the, at the crop level or even larger, the land surface uh, model. Finally, we also plan to use more and more machine learning methods to improve the model and make them faster. And that's in two major ways. The first one, as we explained in the presentation, is to link the data better with the model, but also to use the machine learning methods to shortcut our uh, mechanistic models, which take some time in some situation. We could use the machine uh, learning methods to speed up and shortcut some part of these uh, models. So thank you for your attention. And we are happy to take questions either now or later. Bye. <laughs>